So um, in the summer of 2016, uh, my colleague in ODL, Cody Goddard, and I met with uh, course author Bond Siegel to talk about freshening up her lecture videos in her fully online Large 60 course. And uh, to Bond's credit, Large 60, you need to know, was actually a very early fully online course at Penn State, never mind the college. So it really was time for it to get you know a bit of renewal. But we soon realized that the real project was not just a video refresh. It was a complete course redesign. And what we recognized was an opportunity to refine the instructional design of an already pretty solid, uh, pretty solid course. So how hard could it be? Uh, and if you know the Gilligan's Island reference, our large 60 three hour tour um, turned into considerably more than that. <laughs> we were not on a deserted island, um, but there was a course, a, a, excuse me, a professor there. And in fact, there were two of them and Trudy just joined us online uh, as well. That's Trudy Dixit, the instructor of the course. Um, and so the three of us were the, the core design team. So what is Large 60? It's the cultural, excuse me, cultural history of um, design places. And it's just an introduction to the development of designed outdoor places stretching from the ancient past all the way to the present day, all over the world. The scope is very, very big. And so you want to think about gardens and plazas and parks and temple complexes and street designs in American towns and estates, and the list just goes on and on. But some of the important ideas in the course were uh, uh, things like the, the role of a culture's beliefs and their values and their aspirations, how that's reflected in design, the physical environment and how that exerts a shaping influence on what get, what's gets designed, and also the human connection to nature that you really see in, in every design. But the central idea of the course was that the designed landscape tells us stories but students really have to learn how to read those stories and they have to know how to interpret uh, the different layers of meaning found there. And so really the course is all about equip equipping them to do that. Uh, oops, sorry, I might scroll down. So, um, uh, Kind of diving into the course. So this major course re the revision was completed in 2019 and version 2.0 of the course um, kind of looks like this. Uh, let me see here where my, oh, there we are. Course structure, that's what I want. It is 36 lessons across six modules. And so uh, if we were to look into any one of those modules in particular, like module two, you can see that it's uh, approximately six lessons in length for a module. There's a module review, which in a, in a really abbreviated description here is kind of like a repeatable sample practice quiz for credit. It just gives them the flavor of the kind of questions they're going to face on the real module quiz that's worth considerable amount of, of the course grade. And furthermore, if we go down into the lesson level, one of the things I liked is we were very careful to have a very consistent, repeatable sequence of learning activities. And so we always started off with a one page Reader's Digest preview of the lesson as a whole. And then we used Bonge's um, lesson outline, which uh, walked through all of these different sub lessons, pointing out the high points in all of the videos. And students would print these off and it was chiefly how they how they took notes. And then the lesson, which would a whole lesson might equate to something like 45 minutes of, of lecture time, we would chunk that down into smaller pieces. And then the last piece in a lesson was uh, very important. It was the study guide. And these were just all of the questions that students needed to know they could answer for themselves for all of the lessons in the upcoming uh, module quiz. If we pop back quickly to uh, to this and the lecture preview just was another one pager that served that same kind of function, but specifically for the video lecture upcoming. And then this is what I'm going to be focusing on today. It was the, the lecture video uh, as accompanied by these check your understanding questions that we're going to dive into more today. And so that kind of gives you the whole kind of scope of the course. So how did we do? Well, uh, in full disclosure, there were bumps in the road and some of our refinements needed refinement. So not every brilliant idea worked out 
quite quite as we thought. But generally, I think we did well. And even from the pilot offering onwards, it was apparent that we had really shifted the grade performance and uh, that type of thing. The whole class, as a course as a whole, had moved up compared to what the original design had been. Um, and so that that went pretty well. So today I'm just going to focus on uh, these two two aspects. And even the narrow focus doesn't really let me do any justice to Bonja's really excellent uh, video lectures. Um, so instead, what we're going to do is just sample a snippet of one of them from her lecture on Versailles, which is a personal favorite of mine. And now that you're familiar with um, this course structure, permit me to just switch sites here. This is going to look all out of context now, but this is just for my own ease and demoing. Uh, so. Well, back to Vaux forever so briefly. In perfect step with this climate of massive spending, we'll see Andre Lenotre far surpasses his first design effort at Vaux Le Vicomte by creating the world's most elaborate chateau grounds. Yes, Vaux was a Baroque, Baroque uh, masterpiece, but it was easily dwarfed by its new cousin, Versailles. Now, to give you an idea of its enormity, the Grand Canal that you see in the distance is about a mile long. The entire site is one quarter the size of Paris, comprising thousands of acres. The total length from the uh, entrance court to the garden's furthest extent is eight miles. And it's at this grand scale that an important design feature can be introduced, the Goosefoot intersection. The intersection of LAs, or paths, if you will, in their intersection at a single point, 60 degrees between outside roads, as you see here. This is the same as the human cone of vision. Thus, a visitor can see all at once when focusing on a single point in the middle. Well, this is true for the king looking outside his room into the entrance court, as it is for those exiting the chateau to take in the vast gardens. Really love that. I would love to show more, but time presses on, and so we've got to keep going. But I hopefully enjoy that as much as I did. So down here at the sub-lesson level, um, what we did is uh, for every video in the course, we had at least one check your understanding, self-check type of question. Sometimes there were several. And um, it's easy to confuse this with a quiz, but it's not a quiz. And in fact, it's not even a graded activity. So this is really what you'd call a no stakes learning activity. And the idea was to facilitate active uh, learning uh, from a bit of wrestling with the important concepts in, in the videos. Um, and that no stakes nature of these questions really freed us up to uh, pose uh, different kinds of questions and thought challenges than what you would typically do on a quiz or exam. And we found that really kind of freeing. And a simple example of that is just the select all that apply format. So the correct answer here could be any combination really of these. And I'm gonna get it wrong uh, to begin with. And feedback is just so important in learning. And what I love about this is that there's both visual feedback and verbal feedback. So at a glance, I can see that I, I got a couple of things right. I was partially correct in this, but I can also see that um, you know, the popular styles of architecture and city planning in England was incorrect. And interestingly, um, I don't yet know whether if I had chosen the un, that other option there, if that would have been correct or not. So um, the other thing here, though, is the verbal feedback, which is even more important. And I, what we did here is you'll notice we didn't give them the answer. We didn't just tell them. Instead, what we did is we gave them hints. And um, we gave them some this part of the answer, gave them some things to think about and kind of invited them to go back into the, the video and listen again or simply try the question again. And I think that was an important part of the design. So they can simply try the question again and we'll get it right this time. His reverence and the Roman Republic is an inspiration. And uh, that one is now correct. So if I then... Uh, look down here a little bit, I can see that there actually is a second question in that set. So I'm gonna advance onto that. We see that we use the select all that apply again. And the question here shifts the focus from his inspirations to his design goals. And so uh, we'll just get this guy wrong too. Oh, you know, you try to get it wrong and then you don't get it wrong. 
Well, that just blew the whole thing up. Well, at any rate, uh, then when when students click see your results, and this was a really important discussion point with Bonge and Trudy, they said, you know, we don't want to see a score. We don't want to see a percentage. We don't want to see anything that implies a graded performance. So what we did is simply said, hey, how, how did you do out of the number of questions that were posed? And then students can just click this repeat review button and they will get the same questions uh, over again. So uh, the other thing that's kind of interesting, I think here is the interplay between the video and the questions. By and large, I'm quite sure that nearly all students watch the video end to end, and then they answer the check and understand questions end to end. Nothing, nothing insane about that, right? But I think what's kind of interesting is you wouldn't have to do it that way. You could preview these questions and say, hey, let me keep an ear out for that when I hear it in the video. Either way is fine with us. We just want you to learn. So, um, and, and in between there is a lot of toggling back and forth between the two. So uh, let's look at some more powerful uh, formats than this. So this is a drag and drop question. Um, we're familiar with those as well. However, you most often see it for like a simple column matching. Um, but it's, I like it as a format because I think it's powerful and um, Malika Bose would like to be in. With her too. Hi, Malika. Um, usually it's just a simple column matching, uh, you know, uh, type of exercise, which is fine. But as a format, it's so much more um, powerful, I think, than that. So in this case, what we did is we gave them a recognizable visual taken from the video uh, that they should already be familiar with. And what we do down here is we ask them to um, give us, first of all, the name of the that particular piazza and also tell us where it is located. It really is located on part of, as part of the sacred network. And then importantly, what are the significant design features for that? And so it's got that obelisk at the convergence. That's important. The piazza is in the shape of an oval. That's a very dynamic Baroque shape, and we're studying Baroque right now. And then the twin churches were added facing uh, between the avenues. And so these extra red herrings, we're not going to choose. And we get told we did a good job there. And that's uh, the correct answer there. Um, so two more examples. I'm not going to actually take our time to answer these. I just wanted to show them a little bit more of that flexibility that I mentioned. Um, this one really asks about uh, Jefferson as a borrower of ide ideas as seen in Monticello. And in this case, we help the student out a little bit by saying, hey, think about cap Capability Brown and uh, Andrea uh, Palladio as, as sources that he would have uh, taken the borrowed from. And so then what they do here is simply uh, choose the inspirations, but it has to be the matching design feature from Monticello. And so in this instance, it's it's those slots are very specific. There's only one correct answer for each one of those uh, slots. And then one last one. Um, this probably pushes it about as far as we can push it. <laughs> um, this is a pretty involved question, but if you actually listen to Bonja's lecture, it's all there. And so what we really wanted to focus on was students making the connections between all of these things and seeing the relationships between these things. And the question ends up being so much more than just some collection of facts. And so um, uh, Pantheon is what we're actually asking about. And so it's the temple to all Roman gods. Uh, the design characteristics are that has very strong emphasis on center. It's organized and man, is it innovative. And we see that. Where do we see that? Well, we see it in the one entrance on Axis, uh, the fact that uh, it's got a windowless sphere with an oculus, which is really cool. And there's a, it's the largest unreinforced concrete dome. And what's the point? And this is always the great thing. What's the instructional? So what of all this? It's the built form that really embodies confidence and pride. And so I just think that's a really interesting ability to do that with these questions. That is one question that covers an awful, awful lot of ground. But moving onwards, just a couple of more. Then uh, this is one that actually was a format that the Schreier Institute taught me years ago and thought it was interesting. Um, really easy to write, and you, you don't really see this very often. So we're all familiar with true and false questions. But this is true and false with justification. So um, there's two true, whoops, I'm on the wrong question. Two true questions or two true answers there, two false answers, but there's also a because, there's the why there. 
And so it's really kind of neat the way it takes a true false question and then converts it basically into a, a multiple choice question. And so they need to be able to not only say whether it's true or false, but to say why. So it just makes that an easy way to do a little bit more robust question on that. And then one final question, um, we were in East Asian garden typologies here. Now this is a little bit of a weird picture to look at. I kind of mashed up two different uh, visuals taken from their video. Um, on the left half of it is looking up, looking up at this uh, uh, temple site. And then uh, on the right, we're looking out from that very temple site. And, uh, oh, well, I missed a bit of a preamble here. So back to this kind of liberating nature of these self-check questions. Um, it lets you do some of the things you wouldn't normally do on a quiz or exam. And for instance, on a quiz or exam, you would never ask a question with three correct answers. <laughs> You're just begging for trouble. But here, they really are all uh, that way. So why would we do that? There are times when you want to pose to students a set of good answers, but you really want them to choose the best answer. Or you want them to really, can they get at the essence of something and not give you back um, something that's correct, but it's kind of more peripheral. And that's what this question was really trying to do. So what it asks is, all of the statements below are true, um, but only one best describes the key design idea being communicated in a two-shot panel of the scenic spot. Which one is it? Well, it's definitely nature at full scale. So if I were to answer that, yeah, I'm partly right, but that's not really the best answer there. And so the feedback helps me out. The scenic spot is a response to the Chinese love of nature, where the architecture complements and balances the magnificent natural landscape. Ah, now maybe what I'm thinking is instead, it's a bit more like balanced duality. You know, the yin and yang of seeing and being seen being equally important. And indeed, that's correct. So just to wrap up here, um, we don't have time to read all these, but I'll let you glance at them for a moment. The one I, I do have to kind of call this one out for Bonge because I love it. Specifically on the videos, one student said, the course videos were all super informative and engaging. I looked forward to watching them and would binge watch a couple of lessons at a time, almost like a new season of a show on Netflix. I'm almost sad that we're already done. <laughs> Don't you love to hear almost, almost yeah, key, key operative word, that's right, is almost, I'm almost sad. Uh, but you can see some some other things here, but, and students varied, it it, it does vary in terms of, of uh, the view that they took, but I think generally uh, they're perceived really very well. And then on the check your understanding questions, you know, kind of a similar kind of response. It made me feel good to see at least a few students saying, hey, I really use these all the time and... Uh, it's really helped me in the course. And then finally is just some of the combined impact of other things we didn't touch on as much today, but in terms of uh, those study guides and, uh, you know, the review quizzes and all the other things that were in the mix to help them do well on the course. Large 60. <laughs> Thank you. Over to Deb.
all I did was just introduce myself. So I'm just Deb Golick. <laughs> and I'm going to start with it with this course. Okay. So um, the story of the course is, um, so there I am at the annual staff retreat. All right. And it's a place that you wouldn't think that a, a course would get started, but I was talking to Alan Sutley and he's the shop technician at the Stuckman shop. And I asked him what he does. And he told me that, yeah, I train students and, and um, I have to go over the same booklet all the time. So he, this is what he started off with. And he would just go in and he would have students come in and he would train students over and over again. But then he said, you know, he works with the students with the shop and he's very excited about that and everything that he does. Um, then I got to thinking about it. I'm like, well, maybe we could put that online for you. So you don't have to do that. And students can, can watch it and everything like that. So he thought about it a while. And um, then we just sort of got the ball rolling a little bit. And we talked about it. He came to the office. Um, we found out that it was very time consuming. It's very, it's like, took about like six hours of training time. Um, that's six hours of classroom for each student group of students that he taught. And they were from our uh, landscape architecture and architecture. So that was about 160 students that were spending a lot of time out of classroom in, in the shop, getting trained on these tools before they can get started. Oftentimes he had to repeat the instruction because students were having a hard time. Um, delayed grading because he would give them a test, but then maybe uh, grades were de delayed and they would have um, delayed access to the shop because everybody has to get trained on safety. We don't want anybody to get sued here at Penn State. So everybody had to be trained on safety and, and things like that. I actually went to the course and um, I went and viewed it for myself. And it was very difficult to see how there was a whole classroom of students all gathered around like the the, the table saw and everybody was trying to see everything that he was pointing to and everybody was trying to see what was he was talking about. There were so many different tools within the shop. By the time he got to the end, which was, I think was the bandsaw and that was at the end, there's this big picture window and I could see students starting to gaze out the window. <laughs> you know, they're starting to gaze out the window and I myself was gazing out the window and I was like, all right, the time's up. Um, so, um, that's how the, how the whole thing got started. So uh, we went ahead and we we got a team together. Our development team was Alan, of course. He's the course author. He is the the Stuckman shop technician. He's very 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 knowledgeable about what he does. I would trust him anytime to to teach me and to help me and guide me into that shop. He was just really knows what he's doing. I was the instructional designer. Cody Goddard is the uh, multimedia specialist and he did an awesome job with the videos. And I really wanted to showcase a lot the work that he did on this because he really took the time to um, really highlight distinctive features in the videos. And I'll be explaining some of those things later and showing those to you. Um, Brian Allendike, he was the programmer um, that I worked with. Uh, of course, just the Elms, the basic Elms um, platform that we used um, at the time. And he also helped a little bit more with finding a specific uh, quiz tool that we could use. So that was helpful. So our online prototype ended up being 16 snackable modules. Okay, I say snackable in that you could do them anytime, anywhere. Um, you could do them in little bits and it's, it doesn't like, mean you have to do them in a three hour time frame to do them. If you feel like watching one now, you could do it. Watch another one maybe later on after class or whatever. So students had the opportunity to be a little bit more flexible with that. Um, each module has an introduction. Um, then there's an operation video, like how the, the, um, the tool works itself. Then the safety hazards. We really highlighted the safety hazards and the features of what, what the students had to be careful of um, because a lot of students had some bad habits that they brought with them from other times that they've been in other shops and they didn't realize it, and we didn't want them to carry that with them. Um, in total, it was three and a half hours of video training compared to the six hours that they would have to have been in online training before. And then they would have to do a safety quiz. Everybody has to get 100% on those quizzes. No, there's, there's no um, working around that. Everybody had to have 100%. And then after they did that, they had to complete a hands-on pencil box project. And that was part of the, the other training that they did. So for example, the table saw, I said it was broken down. Like I said, the parts and the general operation of it. Um, we talked about the different cuts 
um, like the rip cut, the cross cut materials. And then we talked about the material selections. Oh, there's only certain materials that you can use for all the different tools. Some tools just, or some materials just won't work when you're trying to cut or work with them on some of the, the tools in the shop. Kickback, kickback is huge. You could take out an eye. Um, you know, students don't want to listen to to all of these things and they feel very confident in what they're doing. But honestly, you know, we're all, some of us are parents or uncles or aunts, and we all know that we worry about our kids, but the kids, they know what they're doing, right? But we need to make sure that they're trained on this, even though they may not be super excited about doing it. All right. So I want to demonstrate a little bit about the course or what it looks like. Okay. So there's the welcome, nothing super, super fancy here, but, um, We, have, we gave the students just a, a general welcome to the whole entire course. As you can see on the left-hand side here, all the different um, tools that we actually had them talking about, okay? Everything from the table saw, band saw, miter saw, drill press, vertical pan saw. And anybody who has been in a shop, you understand these things. And if you've never been in there, you don't. And I, I myself have never worked in the shop. So going over there and seeing all these things and how powerful they actually are was kind of really scary and how you could really really hurt yourself if you're not sure and confident about what you're doing. So let's open up the table saw here. We've got the parts and general operation. Um, so I'm just going to go through this. The beginning is a little bit hard because I had him really, I wanted the students to know what they were getting into before they watched each video. So I had him read through um, a list of, okay, at this, this, what each video will be about. Okay. And then in, as you watch on with the video, pay attention to the specific uh, features and how they're, we brought them to the, uh, the student's attention. Okay, so let me put my this on high. And... In this segment, you will begin to learn about the table saw. You will learn to recognize some of the common uses of the saw, and you will learn how to identify the parts of the table saw that you need to know in order to use the machine. You will also learn how to identify four table saw accessories, and you will learn to recognize the function of the saw stop break, which is a built-in safety feature of the saws in the Stuckman shop. The table saw is one of the most frequently used machines in the shop, and it's great for making accurate straight cuts in flat panels or boards. In general, the table saw is used for medium to large scale work. It's not a good machine to use when cutting tiny or short pieces. Flat stock can often be cut to correct size by simply using the rip fence as a guide. If stock does not have enough surface area in contact with the fence to keep it stable, we will need to use an attachment known as a miter gauge to guide the material that we are cutting. Several types of joints can be cut just using the rip fence or the miter gauge. Examples of three common joints that use either the rip fence or the miter gauge are the miter joint, the dado joint, and the rabbit joint. Other types of joint can be cut using specialized jigs. For example, box joints, also called finger joints, are cut using an indexing jig and a special blade called a dado blade. Okay, so that was just a short example of what one look, looked like um, and just to see the beginnings and the opening of each one of them. All right, so there, um, I just wanted to show um, some of the other, um, here's the parts and general operation. I'm not gonna go through the video, but as you can see just from the beginning, how close up that we got to all these different tools, how we used warning signs that students pay attention to this, um, then with the, with the rip cut, the same thing we, with prep, we let them know when they had to prep something and ahead of time, you had to set the blade at a certain height. Therefore right here, he's like, he's shown how he needed to, to highlight that there. That was so well done. Um, the left hand and the right hand he did, he compared one and the other, what we needed to do, um, the cross cut, he, don't do this. It was, we we're very clear about what to do and what not to do, what it was helpful. Material selections, that was really great. Kickback, we went through the, the causes of kickback and how, how that happens and how to avoid it. And of course we had our, um, here he did check marks for things that were right. And on the, on the right-hand side, he went ahead and said, this is what's not right. So you can use flat boards, but you can't use boards that are bowed like this, that's wrong. So it was very well done um, in how, how he handled all of those. And the precautions, we, we basically, we had to give him all the precautions. And cause these are, these are um, this is signage that they actually see in the shop. So they had, had to understand what it meant so that they understood what they were getting themselves into. If they didn't want to listen to anything, 
And um, yeah, so I just thought that was very well done. So let me go back to my presentation slide. All right, so student feedback. Um, the videos, um, they, they show how to use the tools and they were very instructional and clear. Um, I went up one to my student feedback. I wanted that one first. Um, there was a balance between online learning and hands-on would be optimal is what a lot of students felt. They felt like even though that they had the opportunity to, to, to see all the details, they actually wanted the hands-on the on, uh, actually be in the shop. Um, but they didn't understand what the other training was like, but it would still would have been hard for them to see it anyway. Right. And so some students never used a shop before, and they were just a little overwhelmed, which I understood that. It was just, for me, it was even overwhelming. Um, the video showed how to use the tools and they were very instructional and clear. Um, their flexibility, it, it was, there was flexibility to watch the videos at their own pace. Um, students can rewatch the videos as they needed to. And that was something that we wanted them to be able to do. Um, if they're working on a project, they don't need to go up to Alan and ask him again. They can watch the videos at any time and go back to them. Um, and one, one student said the video showed the, the machines in motion, which helped make it easier to understand. All right, so the current status of the course, though, after all that work and everything, all that shakedown, because it's been about five, six years now, okay? They still have about 160 new students that are trained each year from architecture and landscape architecture, and they're graduate and undergraduate students. Um, the online shop safety course is a prerequisite now to a short in-person exercise that takes about one and a half hours to complete. So we still brought down the time, not completely. We, it, it wasn't like they could could only do the online, but you know we, we could do that. And part of the reason why is the environmental health and safety guidelines required a hands-on component. Mm -hmm. They actually had to do that. Um, so they had to add that back in. Um, these booklets are no longer distributed. And I would say that that is a uh, cost and time savings. Um, for us, and not to mention the benefit of sustainability in our environment, right? They're not throwing them out and printing them off. Um, and the pencil box, they used, students used to have to complete a pencil box, but they no longer have to do that. Some, for some, they still have to, but not for everybody. And that's um, that's where this, the course landed as of now. And if anybody has a project like this, that's a little bit more unique, that's not necessarily um, for course credit. Um, that's something that's like a shop. I was, you know, I, I wasn't sure exactly what, maybe even something like what the place we're in right now. Maybe we don't understand how to use all the tools. Sometimes we come in here, we can't figure them out. Maybe we could do like a video or something like that and put that online. Students could watch it before they get in here or even the faculty could watch it before they come in here and they would know what they're doing or anything like that. They um, reach out to Gary, he's the assistant dean of digital learning and he will talk to you about, about it and vet it and see whether or not it's a good idea. And then Chris Stubbs, which is the director of our office, um, he will make sure it gets um, on, on one of our um, project lists and make sure that we, we are ready to get it started for you. And thank you very much. So Introduction to Visual Studies, uh, Art 10, is in the process of being remade. Um, what makes this course interesting as part of its revision is that it is a course study on uh, visual applications for art making, but it is predominantly a study in uh, identity. And the reason that that gets interesting is I'm not going to show you a bunch of course pages because you've already seen what we do in that realm. Um, but what it allows us to do are some more interesting projects. So this is a virtual gallery that is was originally manifested as part of a grant with Teaching and Learning and Technology. Um, we are presenting it here because they are also instructional designers and because we are managing it going forward. So as a technical demonstration, it is not a limitation of the office. It's just simply one that started somewhere else that we've adopted. But that's right, you can jump in this world <laughs> a little faster. Years of playing World of Warcraft will never stop telling you <laughs> jumping is faster than running. Uh, so what we're looking at here is 
a virtual art gallery that is exhibited in a number of our undergraduate um, general education art classes in some form or another. But this is you know, an opportunity to allow online students in particular to experience itself, a sense of uh, residential instruction because something that we cannot replicate easily in an online world is presence. And presence is important to establishing identity and belonging both for students and attachments to universities, um, but also it helps with their coursework just in the kind of things that they contribute and the level of feedback that they get between their classmates and themselves moving forward. And what we can see here are, a little closer. This is a study on nests, which students are just kind of wrapped up everything for. So this is a fairly complete looking gallery. Uh, what we can see here are students submitted um, some initial demos of what they intended to build as a final project, uh, as well as an artist statement. What you can see here is that they have attached yellow post-it notes beneath it. That's feedback from other students. And what makes this virtual gallery interesting is I could send this link to all of you right now and we would all be in the same space to develop. So in addition to it having a built-in chat and text function within those spaces, students can leave passing notes to each other about commenting on the different artwork. Uh, and they can also literally see each other because they're going to be passing each other every time they come in. Um, and that adds, sorry, let me drop it up. Adds some really, really interesting perspectives for students uh, who have given effectively nothing but positive feedback to them. We'll go back to here. Um, something else that this course does is provide some of these additional resources. So this goes beyond just basic course lessons, but goes to show you where these conversations lead across multiple perspectives across the board. And this extends also into these annotated bibliographies that we have in the class. And you'll see there is a link. Um, that is a direct link to a catalog uh, website in the university libraries. So if I click that, we're demonstrating to students on top of everything else that not only did they pay tuition for a class, but all the other stuff that they pay tuition for <laughs> is also still very present to them, even if they're not aware of it regularly. So we've taken really good care in this course to make sure that students are aware of a variety of different resources that are available to them. And as a model, something that we hope and everything else that continue to do is present these additional workings around the university that students really have access to that are either being underutilized or uh, students simply aren't aware of them existing. And for world campus students in particular, that is a big gap. I really should find that much up here. <laughs> anyway, um, that leaves us with about 13 minutes of the short version. So uh, we'll open the floor to questions, comments, statements of the same time. Yeah. What are these built on? As in the course websites. So the program is a homebrew development. Uh, called HACS, H-A-X, stands for Headless Authoring Experience. Um, the software itself uh, exists on its own, but can also be effectively slapped on top of any other uh, WYSIWYG style editor. So if you're more familiar with things like WordPress, technically there's an overlay that we could throw it on top of that as well. So even the questions that you uh, oh, I meant to say that. Thank you. I, those questions happen to be done in H5P, uh, a separate program. We do have a small subset, not as rich as that. We have a small subset in tax that uh, is equivalent. And that's probably something we're going to keep pushing as we go. But yeah, I meant to mention that that's actually a separate program. Yeah. Uh, as you can see, like we were importing videos from YouTube, we can import videos from Kaltura. It hosts everything. It's still functionally an HTML back program to build such a 
it's just a little bit more intuitive and it will increasingly become better looking every day than yeah, here until like the, rest of the next six months. <laughs> <laughs> How does it integrate with Canvas? Uh, you can iframe it in exactly the way you would do any other external program. Uh, it is Penn State native already, so everyone here already has the ability to go to hacks.psu.edu and build a thing in it. We would advise strongly before you do that to talk to one of us so that we can make sure that you are aware that it has limitations and what you can do with it. But it is a full-fledged publishing option that you can use. It's very accessible. In fact, it's built entirely around ally principles. Um, so it's good to go. It's significantly better than using WordPress currently if you're an external facing site. It just has, there are points where you want to talk to us before you start building anything. If we stop down and talk to us or just contact us, we'd love to, if you're interested in just exploring it, that'd be fantastic because we're actively seeking, particularly faculty input back. It, it's, it's, I mean, you certainly build your courses in it, but it's also a blogging platform, personal faculty academic site. You could do it for any type of information. I love how it became really like a, a, a way. So, are you five books? Mm -hmm. I know of it. I mean, and it does that. So, do reading chats, and it, you have to go through, and I just, yeah, as an aside example on this, um, the learning design community has a summer conference every year. Uh, and this is the website we're using this year, but you can see it follows the same format, but it just runs like any other website. And I can take this as it exists now without doing significant modification to it. And just by changing the theme, make it look like a WordPress website or make it look like the course websites we displayed which you can't do in WordPress. The minute you set something up, you got to redo the whole thing from scratch. You can change themes, but that's it. Yeah, no, but we're talking about total layout changes, everything. Um, do you have to do any HTML? No. CSS? No, no CSS. We've taken that completely up. It's actually writing HTML for you. It, it writes to these basically custom web tags that are going to live forever. So it's so foundational that you can take the site and just download it, you can take it somewhere else with you. Um, like Brenda was saying, you can actually use other tools and then you can just really check the bit of hacks go in there and you can do that. Um, so yeah, it's, it's it's gotten it's kind of hit an inflection point just this year. And um, we have a we have a course that was done um, by Invent Penn State. They actually adopted hacks to use that. And we're very happy with it and are thinking they might use it for the whole portfolio. So all of my students. All my one Penn students, of course, are going to be speaking on all of our courses, um, right? So this is why in the mile. So um, we, I mean, I would make with help, you know, if we talk about it. But um, I would love to do that instead of, because I'll do Google Sites and then do Now, yeah. yeah. Or I have some who will do a full deal, right? That's what it meant Penn State moved off. In fact, Penn State was on a Google site and we helped them move their stuff from a Google site all the time. If there was a little bit of content um, over to PAX, and they have been piloting one of their courses since about January. We're expecting to be here from back from them pretty soon. Thank you. Thank you. If you want all of the good details, talk to him. <laughs> we can all use it, but he's actually the 